political heirs of slain Lebanese leaders are poised to make a strong showing in this year's parliamentary election, keeping alive a tradition of dynastic succession. Amin Jemael's son, Sami, is the latest in the Jemael line to enter the world of politics. While Christianity may be on the wane regionally, in terms of numbers at least, the Christians of Lebanon are determined to retain their influence. For the first time, Sami Jemael is campaigning for a seat in Parliament. He is 28 years old, the same age as his father was when he won his seat four decades ago. And for the son, as for the father, the old issue of identity remains paramount. نحن اليوم عم نفتقد لعنصر كتير أساسي من حياتنا ومن كرامتنا يلي هي هوية. What we are missing today is an important element of our life and our honor, which is our identity. I will tell you today that I, as a Lebanese citizen, my identity is Maronite, Syriac, Christian, and Lebanese. Maronite, Syrian, Messianic, Lebanese. The identity of Lebanon was agreed upon at the negotiating table when the Taif agreement between nearly all of the Lebanese parties ended the civil war. It stipulated that Lebanon is Arab in belonging and in identity, something Sami Jemael disagrees with. <laughs> The Arab identity of Lebanon was created in 1990 based on the Taif Agreement, without any free discussion among Lebanese, and while Lebanon was under Syrian custody, and in the presence of Syrian military inside the Lebanese parliament when voting on constitutional amendments were taking place. Identity and loyalty the twin issues that come to the fore at every key juncture in Lebanon's political history. I wouldn't like Taymour to say that I'm a Druze and I'm a, I'm a Jumblat and, uh, and I'm a Lebanese, no. He has to stick to the big heritage of Kamal Jumblat as an Arab, as a nationalist Arab, and as a human being and as a socialist. Being a Druze means nothing. Being a Druze is just to defend the my minor purpose, the small interest of the losers, he has to be widen his objective and his perspective. It's the decades old battle for the heart of Lebanon, whether to be pan Arab and rely on powerful external patrons, or to stand alone, impartial and liberal. This issue lies at the core of the 2009 elections. And this time, even the Christians find themselves split. The 2009 elections will differ according to where there are majorities. So if there's a Shia majority, the result is guaranteed. Where there is a Sunni majority, the result is practically assured. It is similar in the Druze areas. The real battle is in the Christian community. But whatever the results are, this election will produce a new Christian leadership. But it will not change the overall political scene. The Christian community is now equally divided between two alliances. Jemael and a host of other parties are in the March 14 alliance, led by the son of murdered Prime Minister Rafiq Hariri and named after the date of the so-called Cedar Revolution of 2005, the popular uprising against Syrian influence. The other half supports the free patriotic movement, led by General Aoun. Critics of the movement point to its charismatic leader with relatives in the highest rungs of power, 
and accuse it of being yet another family business, a charge its members dismiss. I don't believe so because when I enrolled in the Lebanese army in 1988, I didn't know the general. And when I enrolled in the Free Patriotic Movement, uh, uh, struggling against the occupation at that time, I didn't know uh, the daughter of the general. So I only met her in 1996. And uh, I am here in the political life uh, due to my enrollment in the Free Patriotic Movement. But it is happening in another well-known Christian family, the Orthodox Twainies. Gibran Twaini was the editor of An Nahar, a well-known Lebanese daily. He was vocal in his condemnation of Syria's physical and political interference in Lebanon over three decades. And in late 2005, he was murdered. Gibran had also been a member of parliament. His vacant seat was taken over by his father, and now his daughter, Naila, is running as a candidate. Interestingly, for the most open society in the Middle East, Naila is only one of 12 women running for the 128-seat parliament this year. Naila's constituency, Beirut District 1, typifies Lebanon's diversity. <laughs> There are two competing lists, but each list will have one Orthodox seat, one Catholic seat, one Maronite seat, one Armenian Orthodox seat, one Armenian Catholic seat. That is a division we have. There are independents, but unfortunately, the individual candidate does not have enough power as the one who is part of a list. Being part of a list makes you stronger. Unfortunately, now in Lebanon, you cannot run for representing anything but your sect. I run for the orthodox seat in Ashrafiyeh. Sadly, we are still based on sects. I am a believer and highly respect my sect, but I wish that one day in Lebanon, politics would not be based on sects. One of the recurring, though unspoken, issues in Lebanon is demography. It's a major concern for the Maronite Christians. They fear being outnumbered by their Muslim compatriots and the resulting erosion of their political power in the region. When Lebanon was created by the French, the Grand Liban, uh, when it was created, it was created on the basis of having a very slight majority of Christians. Uh, the French didn't understand demography at the time very well and uh, they didn't know that the rate of growth of uh, the Muslim population is much higher than the Christian, that the Christian population migrates and the Muslim population doesn't out-migrate. Uh, within a very short period of time, the thing became, it was reversed. No national census has been conducted since 1932, but the Christian Lebanese don't need to be told they're being outnumbered. It's all too clear. And in a religiously fragmented country governed by power groupings and coalitions, numbers are crucial to maintaining a voice in parliament. The fear of numbers has been there for hundreds of years. Nothing new. Lebanon was created to stop that fear. But when the state collapses, so do the institutions and people's fears increase. Why did we participate in the civil war? Is it our jobs to carry guns? It was because of fear from the one who is attacking me, the one robbing peace and stability from me, and fighting me over my earning, dignity, and many things. The fear is always there. How to treat fear? It is by holding on to this country and its civilized experience, defending it always. But many of the politicians contesting the elections are determined to defend their own corner rather than the nation as a whole. I, I don't believe in our role as compared to our number. And I think our role is much bigger than the number. And whoever is trying to diminish the number, saying it is 28%, thinking that he is diminishing our role, this is wrong. We are basically bigger than this, 
in number and in role and no one can eliminate us. We should understand General Aoum within the context of local interests, which are based on raising fears to get people around him by accusing others of conspiring against Christians. For example, he says in his private gatherings that Sunnis are the majority in the Arab world and their domination is detrimental to the minorities. Therefore, the minorities should unite to protect their positions, their privileges, and in order to feel safe. Listening to the politicians, it is sometimes difficult to imagine that Lebanon will ever overcome its identity crisis. But some academics predict a more settled future. Now the situation, I think, is different. Now with education that has spread in the country, uh, most sects have uh, declining fertility. And now the fertility differentials are not that great uh, between uh, uh, sects. And I think it's going to balance out eventually and become almost the same. An educated person has a number of children, no matter what his sect is. But for now, Lebanon's democracy seems as fragile as ever. It's in the nature of fragmented communities living in the same country to fear for their existence, never more so than in times of conflict, whether military or political. The upcoming election gives focus to such fears. We cannot concede power for Hezbollah to take over. We cannot give up our democratic way of life, and we cannot give up on any of our principles. We cannot stay in this, uh, this acute uh, sectarian divisions that might trigger at one time into maybe, unfortunately, maybe into a sectarian strife or civil war. We can't stay in this hatred. We can't build up so-called the so-called so uh, great, great slogans: uh, independence, democracy, civil society are useless. Are useless because we hate each other on the ground. Lebanon's greatest hope for peace, order, and ultimately survival lies in a consensual democracy, however imperfect it may be. All these stubborn hot heads will soon cool down when they are faced with the rock-like Lebanese fact that is consensual democracy. No one can escape from consensus. Some speeches are delivered to stir up and inflame. It is reactionary isolationist rhetoric. That is only said behind closed doors and occasionally comes out in the open. It's not just history that has dealt Lebanon a bad hand. Geography, too. Lebanon, according to some, is a case of the wrong country in the wrong place, yet not entirely beyond hope. We live in a bad neighborhood. And uh, had we been uh, in Switzerland, Lebanon, I think Lebanon would have been the most prosperous country in the world. But we just happen to be in the Middle East. We have to live as part of this area, and we have to take the good and the bad. And, uh, but I don't think that the bad is going to be as bad as in the last uh, uh, few decades.